Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 54 of Humanity Rising. Uh, every day since the 22nd of May, we've been broadcasting live on our Facebook page, on Awake TV, on several dozen of our partnering uh, channels uh, to about 15,000 people. As we've provided an opportunity for organizations and people from all over the world to come together during this extraordinary pandemic and share their experiences, their perceptions, their uh, dreams and hopes about the future, and more fundamentally, how we can all come together in such a way that we can enhance our strategic effectiveness. The pandemic is a signal that all is not well on planet Earth. And the effects of climate change directly produce the conditions for the pandemic. The malaise of our governing elites in terms of their incapacity to govern effectively and in a manner that is in alignment with um, human principles and ecological systems uh, is paying a price. And all of us are now uh, under duress. Virtually everybody in the world is under some kind of lockdown. Uh, we're all engaging in social distancing. Uh, and what we've experienced uh, in a very short period of time is a literal revolution in human behavior in response to a collective disease. Just think about how radically we humans reframed everything once the pandemic set in. More broadly, it's clear that we are in revolutionary times in virtually every category of human endeavor, whether it's technology, whether it's medicine, whether it's economics, whether it's education, travel, culture. As been said, we're no longer in an era of change. We're in a change of eras where everything from the past is being deleted, reworked, or superseded by an accelerating pace of change. Human knowledge today is doubling every 12 and a half minutes. Jobs that were available 10 years ago, two thirds of them don't exist today. And two thirds of the jobs that exist today won't exist in 10 to 15 years. That's how fast things are changing. So we thought that today, since this is July 14th, uh, and Bastille Day, where Frenchmen and people uh, the world over celebrate the uh, achievements, the effects of the French Revolution. This would be an opportunity to, to pause for one of our episodic dialogues with a, a very erudite man, Andres uh, Barblan, took his PhD in political science at the University of Geneva had a series of very high profile, prestigious positions, including as Secretary General of the Association of European Universities. Uh, he's someone that I've gotten to know uh, and deeply respected uh, for his knowledge and just breadth of wisdom and his intense, um, I would say, memory of history. So I thought it would be a, a, a rich opportunity for all of us today on Bastille Day uh, to take a few minutes and ponder afresh the French Revolution and its currency uh, at a time of revolutionary change. So Andres, welcome to our program. And I thought it would be a good place to start by just telling us what transpired today uh, with uh, President Macron and, and the celebrations in France under the circumstances of the pandemic. 
introduction and uh, I'm uh, happy to be with you again and to consolidate our old friendship. So uh, you mentioned that everything is changing. But indeed, the French Revolution was a tabula rasa and they got really everything out, much more than what we are going through today. But we'll discuss that a little later. And, um, but today, 14th of July in Paris, Macron uh, organized a smaller parade than usual, not the big one that uh, President Trump liked so much that he wanted to have the same one in Washington. Um, and uh, he focused the whole thing on the pandemic so that uh, the people who were present were hospital staff, uh, people from old age uh, uh, homes, uh, medical personnel, etc., and uh, people and people who he invited from outside were the Swiss, Germans, and Dutch, because these are the three countries which, during the pandemic, have welcomed or received sick pe French people who were suffering from COVID. And uh, so, for example, here in Geneva, we had 22 of French COVID people um, struck by the disease. So these were the people there. So you see the focus is really on the pandemic and how to fight the pandemic as a state and as a group of states, a community of states. Then he said in an interview that followed that what he wanted that from the 1st of August, all French people will wear masks, not only in the public transportation, which they are supposed to do now, but in old areas which are closed, shops and theaters, etc. So you had at the same time, the glorification of France and the putting, well, the imprisonment of the French people behind their masks from the 1st of August. So what is liberty? What is freedom? What is equality? What is fraternity? These are the three words which usually are linked to the French Revolution. So I thought it was interesting to start with this small discussion because with that example, it happened just two or three hours ago. So we can go on from that because you see how far or how deep the French Revolution is uh, ingrained in the mind of the French people. Yes, well, thank you. Um, tell us uh, uh, your account of Bastille Day. What actually happened on the, the 14th of July, 1789, that that both ignited the French Revolution and became the day that each year um, the revolution is commemorated? So the first thing is that it's not the beginning of the French Revolution. The Etat Généraux, which is uh, the Congress uh, of people from all over France, uh, with, which had been convened at the end of 88 because the situation was very bad. And people in the, in the provinces were saying, we, wa we want to be heard, we want the king to know all the problems we have. You have to know that in those days, there were lots of problems in terms of food uh, because the, the price of bread was climbing all the time. And the 14th of July, if you look at uh, the price of bread, uh, is the highest cost price of the bread since Louis XIV. So, you know, I don't know if there is a link between the two, but I suppose there is a bit of a link between the two. Then the French Revolution didn't start in Paris. It started in Versailles because the, the, capita the capital city was Versailles. So the Etats Généraux were in Versailles. But in Paris, the people felt that uh, they needed some kind of real presence and uh, they created the Commune of Paris just before, 
uh, on the 10th or 11th of July. And at, on the 12th of July, Louis XVI got rid of his prime minister, Necker. So um, this gives you an idea of the, the surrounding, which explains what is happening. So but the Bastille was a 14th century castle, which was at, on the edge of the fortification of Paris from Charles V. And uh, it was one of the main doors of, next to one of the main doors, and um, La Porte Saint Antoine. So uh, this had been used over the centuries as a prison, but also as a palace. And Francois Ier received uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci in that place, you know, so it was not so bad <laughs> after all. And uh, it became the prison mainly for the rich people. So uh, you had the Marquis de Sade, for example, was there for, for a while. Voltaire was there for a while, etc. But the average time spent in the prison was between six months and 12 months. Some people stayed longer. So uh, it represented the place of absolute tyranny because the king from the early 18th century could write what was called lettre de cachet, which you, he could send to prison anybody at any time, as long as he wanted, uh, and these people would disappear. And it was a way, and this was the Bastille. And there's a French word which about this incarceration process, which is called en Bastille, put into the Bastille, en Bastille. So symbolically, it was an important place. And the people of Paris, and it was a mob, it was not uh, an organized thing. It was a mob that came to the Bastille on the 14th of July in the morning, and they were looking for ammunition and guns. And they thought that in such uh, official prison and fortress, they would find such things. They asked for the governor, and the governor refused to give them the, the, the material they were asking for. So they decided to storm the, the Bastille, the, the mob. And uh, the result was that some hundred people were killed on the side of the mob. And uh, there were seven people killed on the side of uh, the defenders of the Bastille. And the defenders were only 35 Swiss soldiers, uh, it was the Swiss guard, and uh, the people were in charge of the prisoners. So it made some hundred people. And uh, so the French, the, the, the mob did enter and they were looking for prisoners and they couldn't find any prisoners nearly. There were only seven in the, in the prison and four were uh, people making fake money. So there were good reason for them to be there. Two were considered as mad people. So there were perhaps also good reasons to, for them to be there. And the seventh was the son of a rich man a nobleman who had decided that uh, his son was doing too many stupid things in his uh, youth and he had to be in prison for a while and it would calm him down. So he would pay the, the prison to have his son on, on board, you know. Uh, it was a boarding, a boarding place for him. So these were seven people. So the, the, the mob was very annoyed because they didn't find lots of people, lots of prisons they could show around, etc. So they invented one of the first fake news of those days, which was to create a terrible man who was found, uh, you know, lying down in the dungeons and the, at the level of the moat in, in humidity and uh, uh, suffering a lot. He hadn't been eating for quite a while and they got they, I don't know where they found the real man for that. But anyway, they took this person and brought him out and showed it to the people of Paris saying, this, you see, we have managed to get, to get rid of the tyranny. And this is the example. So in fact, 
the Bastille was never a military important moment. It was a symbolic important moment for the, and it was important because it was a people of Paris, which had been deprived of the status as capital city since Louis XIV. And uh, when he moved the, the court to Versailles and they wanted to show that they had the power. And at the same time, they were suffering because they had, the, the, they had no food, the bread was very expensive. And it, you know, the, there were good reasons to be unhappy. And at the same time, there were foreign troops not far and they were afraid that, this, that Louis XVI would call these troops in to get rid of them. So that's the less romantic view of the Bastille Day. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, you know, history is as much legend and myth uh, and narrative. You know, people, uh, you know, one thinks of, you know, the stories about George Washington sitting under the apple tree and so forth. To, to the, the knowledge of uh, any historian, most of the stories didn't really happen. But once they enter into the collective consciousness and mythology, they, they become real in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, thank you for that. You know, one other aspect that I think is, is worth uh, bringing to people's attention, because I think it's very relevant uh, to the world today, is the role of women. Uh, the, the role that women played in the French Revolution was extremely important uh, and may have been more important in the French Revolution than the role that women played in many, many other revolutions. So I uh, uh, would appreciate your comments and narrative on the role that women played in the unfolding revolutionary days. So for the second half of the 18th century, there were a lot of discussions of who could be a citizen and what were the rights that uh, allowed you to consider yourself no longer as a subject of the king, but as a citizen of a country. They were not speaking yet of a nation. This will come. And um, in these discussions, people like Diderot in, uh, from the Encyclopédie uh, in the middle of the 18th century considered that women were equal to men. And there were another two or three of these encyclopedists who considered that women were equal to men. So, you know, the theme was present in the discussions. But there were others like Rousseau, who considered that women had nothing to do but to make children and stay in the kitchen. So uh, that's another view of Rousseau which we don't speak so much of. But anyway, he was very much a misogynist, if it's the way you say it. Yeah, and, misogyny. Um, yeah. So when the revolution started, it was mainly the women of Paris linked to this I just mentioned they created a commune. The commune was a way, there were some 60 or 70 sections in the, in the, in the city. And they decided that they would put all this, all this in one uh, group from a political point of view, have different people there. And so women were uh, very much in forefront. And during the Bastille day, they were there with the, the men in the mob. And later on, when um, the, the king was brought from Versailles to Paris a year later, uh, because people wanted to control the king. So the people who went in front from Paris to look for the king were the women of Paris, not the men. And they arrived in Versailles and asked to see the king and see the queen. And, and said, now you come back with us. We bring you back to home, that is in Paris. And that's what they did. But of course the men had joined by then, but the first ones were the women. So this shows that really women were trying to find a place in the system. But the people who had been in charge of the Etat Généraux or l'Assemblée were uh, bourgeois or small bourgeois, petite bourgeoisie, and they were all dressed like the nobles in those days. That is, they had uh, uh, 
culotte, as you know, the, the upper part up to the up to the knee, and then they had stockings, etc. Uh, the people dressed like the noble people, and uh, the people representing le tiers état, that is, uh, ninety-eight percent of the population, they were lawyers or people who had, uh, you know, they had been ex nominated, but they were usually from the upper class themselves. So the only thing they did to show that they were from the tiers état, they dressed in black with a white tie and a black uh, hat. So that's why you, you could recognize the people representative of the tiers état, but they still had the culotte and the stockings. So the, pe the people of Paris then said, no, that's not, that's not enough. We want to have real power and we are going to show it in our dress. So the, the trousers were brought in. So the people of Paris, the lower classes, uh, dressed with pantalon, that is uh, trousers, and the trousers were with the stripes and the stripes were blue and white or red and blue. And so the colors of the, uh, of the flag, you know? and to show that they were patriots, but that they were of the lower classes who represented the majority of the people. That's les sans culottes. Uh, you have seen that word uh, here and there. And they played a very important part until uh, the end of the revolution, the main part, period of the revolution, 1795. So the women were also dressed differently. They started having skirts, because before they had, they needed to have gowns going down to the to the to the feet. Or they had skirts, and to show that they were free and they could move much more freely than with long skirt, long <laughs> gowns, uh, and uh, also with the colors uh, like the men and so forth. And so that it's a change of the fashion which allows the presence of these people. And when the Etat Généraux moved from, from, from Versailles to Paris, uh, the, the, the deputies, the members of parliament, what you call, would call today the members of parliament, they met in Les Tuileries, and um, there the, 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 the members of parliament could speak, uh, you know, they were all men, but all around there were galleries where women could uh, look uh, what was going on. And there were hundreds of women which were just looking at the man making politics and uh, they would intervene. So say <laughs> clapping or shouting or, you know, uh, making fuss and stopping the, the whole discussion. So, you know, they were a kind of uh, informal force trying to say, you know, we have something to say and hear how we are saying it. So that's just to give you an idea of the general thing. And then you have something, if you have read, uh, or if people of, among you have read uh, uh, The Red Pimpernel, uh, which is this series of stories about uh, people who are saved from the guillotine, etc. So you, you have seen about the tricoteurs, that is the, the women knitting, Knit, knit, tricoter is to knit. So yeah. uh, tricoteurs were the knitters. And that's true that the ladies when they, or the women when they were in the galleries, if they had nothing else to do, they would sew or knit. They were using their time as, <laughs> as efficiently as possible. So les tricoteurs played also a part, especially during the terror, because they would go to the scaffold and the guillotine and look at the at the old people being beheaded and you know the, the execution executions would follow every two or three minutes so it, it was really industry so at the same time so i speak here i speak of the of the lower classes women but who played an important part in showing the power but in the upper classes you had people like uh, uh, olympe de Gougy who, uh, well, she changed her name. It's not her name, but it sounds much better to be called Olympia than uh, Jean or Mary, you know? So uh, she wrote, she decided to write, write a declaration of the rights of women and citizens, but in French, you make the difference between citoyens 
and citoyenne. So, you know, it's a Declaration des Droits des Femmes et des Citoyens. So it was taking the, the, the other declaration, the, the l'homme et des citoyens, and uh, adapting it to the needs of women. Then you had another important woman who was called Paul, uh, Pauline Léon, and she uh, started clubs for women. And some of these clubs were entirely, were dressed for women. It was circled for women to discuss women question and women politics. And uh, another one was uh, very different, Manon Roland. She was the wife of the form, uh, one of the ministers of the interior, but she came from a rather low status families, but she was a fantastic woman. She, at four, she could read. At eight, she could speak Latin. At 11, she had read in Latin, Tacitus, uh, Plutarch, uh, and, <laughs> and by 13, she had read Fenelon, Bossuet, and every, everybody else, you know? So these are, that's what is fantastic in the revolution. So you, you discover characters who are fantastic, you know? And uh, who are people you would not imagine even in the best fictions. So Madame Roland became the, uh, she opened a salon, a place where people would meet in 1791, uh, because she was then the, the wife of the minister. So she opened a place where all the main future uh, uh, politicians came, like uh, Robespierre, Herion, Danton, and all these people were there. And, uh, but, We'll come perhaps later on to the, the, the way the, the, the revolution happened, but in 1792, 93, uh, she, uh, the, she was part of the Girondin party, which was the regionalist, the people who thought that France should not be centralized completely. It should be arranged like in the States with various regions, which would be states. And these people, were lost power and uh, one day they were all taken away and the day after they were all beheaded. So uh, that was uh, the, the fast way of doing things. So that's why, you know, if you look at things like that, you, you just think, well, the pandemic, the COVID, etc. <laughs> it's perhaps interesting, but it's nothing like the, the French Revolution for the French people, at least. <laughs> so, yeah. and uh, so that, that to give you an idea of the role of women, uh, and these women, you know, they were respected, uh, the, the, the Olympe de Gouges and all these people, and they were fighting with the men and trying to impose a point of view. But usually the men being more powerful and having more uh, back support uh, won. And in, uh, in 1795, 96, one of the first things of the Directoire was to go to regress and put the women back into the place that is home and children. Um, but this really happened under Napoleon. You know, there, there were different moments. And this, Napoleon, during the consulate in 1801, will we, we reverse to the status of women of the Ancien Regime uh, again. But to finish with the women, in 1792, there was a big law passed by the Convention, which gave civil rights, equal civil rights to men and women. So they had exactly the same civil, civil rights. This means they, the marriage could be dissolved by a mutual consent or because you considered that, uh, you know, there was incompatibility of, uh, 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 of behavior between uh, the, the pair and the couple, members of the couple and things like that. You see, so uh, women could contract, that is really buy things, change things. And this was important to have this law because all properties of the church had been nationalized. And this represented nearly 30% of the surface of France. And this had to be sold because the government needed the money. 
So uh, for wars and all kinds of things. And women, some women had money. And so they needed women to be able to buy this or buy that without asking the husband if it was possible or not. So that's one of the reasons for that 1792 law. But it's, it's a law which is very modern and often much more modern than some of the laws we have today in linking women and men, you know. But the suffrage was uh, given only to at local and regional level, not at the national level. Gotcha, good. Well, thank you. Um, let me ask you another question and then we can delve into some of these larger issues. And that's the relationship between the French and American revolutions. You know, Thomas Jefferson was there in Paris uh, at the onset of the French Revolution. Uh, he held his own salons, as you know, with various people. Thomas Paine, uh, whose uh, common sense was the pamphlet that helped ignite the American Revolution. He was an Englishman, a uh, very uh, interesting man who ended up participating in both the uh, both American and in the French revolutions. Uh, and uh, so there was all kinds of uh, Benjamin Franklin was loved by the French. Um, yeah, so he, was I, ambassador, I your... he was an ambassador of the, of the new states in That's Paris. Right. That's right. And, so um, uh, what, what's, what's your comment on the, so the, the relationship? To, to understand the thing, you have to go back to the war of seven, the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763 which is one of the first world wars from the Western point of view, at least, because it opposed France and Britain for a change. <laughs> and uh, France in those days uh, had its foot in India, in Canada, in Louisiana, and Louisiana in those days was not the state of Louisiana today. It was the whole Southern part of uh, the US, uh, apart from the, the, the Spanish speaking uh, part of the US, California and so on, and Texas, etc. So uh, there was a war which had, which was linked to problems in of succession in Europe. But anyway, uh, the Prussians were on the side of the English, the Austrians were on the side of the French, with the Spanish and so on. These gives you an idea of the conflict in the middle of the, of the 18th century, which led to France being defeated. And France lost Canada, lost Louisiana, lost India. They kept only Pondicherry, uh, which is still today, when you go in Pondicherry on the Western coast of India is still, you know, many things are written in French. Uh, and that's a place where Shri Aurobindo uh, used to live and where Auroville is to make the link to today. But anyway, France was, had nearly no money left and Britain had no money left because it was very expensive to have that war. And George III or the King before decided that the only thing they could do was to increase the taxes. And the taxes was to increase the taxes in particular in the colonies. So that's the beginning of the story which is going to lead to the Tea Party, etc. which when the Bostonians in fact refused to pay taxes on uh, exotic wares. Uh, and that's the beginning of the American Revolution. On the French side, uh, people simply remembered that they had been defeated by the English. So when things started moving in the colonies, and at first, you know, Virginia was one of the first ones to, to start the rebellion against the English, but other parts of the, of the colonies were not all for changing status and moving to something different. And the insurgents were really a small part of the story. So they started and discussion and this led to the to the, uh, the declaration of independence and at that time already the French some of the French were interested to join the movement in and support the insurgents remembering that this would be good to against the Brits and one of these young men 
He was 19 years old in those days, was Lafayette. He arrived in, he arrived in, in, in the US, well, in the colonies, and uh, joined George Washington very early. And George Washington, as one of the leaders of the armies or the troops of the insurgents, asked Lafayette to become one of his generals. So Lafayette was 21 or something like that, and he had very important military duties in the 13 colonies. And he stayed a good friend of, of uh, Washington uh, for the rest of his life and that of Washington. And there is a whole, um, there is a whole correspondence between the two men, which is very interesting, which goes to 18, well, I think Washington died in 1801 or something like that. And so all this part, these 20, 25 years of story is in these letters between these two men. And uh, when uh, Lafayette, who was the president of the National Guard, the, the commander of the National Guard, which has just been created in Paris on the 14th of July. He was part of the, the groups storming. He tried to control the, the mob. And so he decided that uh, when they took the Bastille that he would send to Washington the key of the Bastille. So if you go to Val Mount Vernon today uh, and visit the, the place, uh, the estate of George Washington, you will see in a kind of golden cupboard like that, there is a steel key, which is the, the key, the main key of the Bastille, which was offered by Lafayette to Washington. So that's for the small story, but it's always, for me, it's always interesting to see the details, which gives you yes. an idea of what's really going on at the same time. So the question was, um, remind me, <laughs> The relationship between the French and American uh, yeah. uh, revolution. So, uh, then uh, in 76, the King Louis XVI decided it was important to support the insurgents, but he couldn't do that openly because it would be like declaring war to Britain. So he decided to ask uh, Beaumarchais, who is known as the author of the Marie Mariage de Figaro and Noce de Figaro, or the uh, Barbier de Seville, Barbier de Seville yeah, in, in the opera. But he was a, a tradesman, he was doing hundreds of different things. So he, this, Louis XVI gave him millions of pounds to uh, support the insurgents. So but Beaumarchais created a, a trade center. Uh, a firm which was called Rodrigue Hertales, and uh, right in the middle of Paris. And from there, he started organizing a fleet of 40 ships, which were loaded with cloth, with guns, with tents, with ammunition to go to the US. And well, to the, excuse me, so with the 13 colonies, but anyway, they. They went, they were supposed to go to the Caribbean islands, which some of them were French. So, you know, there was a good uh, reason to go there. So these 40 ships, they were uh, loaded in various parts of the country in France. So some were in, Cher in Cherbourg, others in Le Havre, others in Marseille, others in Bordeaux, because the idea that they would not have, they had to go alone uh, uh, in a different, uh, as a singular boat and not as a, uh, as a convoy, because the convoy would be too obvious for the British uh, fleet, and they would risk uh, being uh, uh, drowned. So the, the British managed to get rid of some of those boats, but some 20 or 25 managed to arrive in La Grenade, in, in, in French Caribbeans, and the insurgents would come and get all this material and give in exchange cotton because that was what was being uh, produced in uh, the southern states of the, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the US. So this is, um, there was this present and this presence of the French supporting the insurgents. This is between, before 78, just after the uh, declaration. And uh, the Congress, 
the young Congress then in the States declared that they owed Beaumarchais $24 million. And dollars of those days were much more important than two days. And uh, so the, but they never repaid it, Beaumarchais back. Beaumarchais died in 1799, he never saw that money. It's his daughter who got only 500,000 of the 24 million in 1830. So <laughs> that's, you know, international relations when they are done on a private basis, it's perhaps even more difficult than it is done between states. But from 78, then uh, Louis XVI decided to support openly the American Revolution or the insurgents. And uh, there were quite a few French people who joined Lafayette, Rochambeau, uh, uh, Roche, La Rochefoucauld, and all those, all these people went there and spent quite a few times during the wars that led to really the creation of the US. And they, when they came back to France, they were called the Americans, the Americans. And there was a group in the National Assembly, which was the Americans. And they had a big a role in the writing of the French Déclaration des Droits de l'Homme, because it was inspired by the, the Declaration of Independence, the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, and then by all the discussions about the Bill of Rights, which were going on in the, the US, but were not uh, finished before 1791. The Bill of Rights was accepted, I think, in 1791 only, uh, after the Declaration. So it's, and it's interesting that Washington became president of the US in April 89, just five days before the opening of the Etat Généraux in France. So you see how the two movements uh, move together. Yes, 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 yes. Well, let's, um, let's uh, broaden it. You know, one of the, the things that you know that historians like about the uh, French Revolution in common is the, its classical expression of the, you know, the four stages of revolution, the, the ancien regime, the monarchy or the old regime, however that is embodied, and then the beginning of re revolutionary change, but it's very moderate. So it goes through a moderate phase of the revolution uh, in the French case, um, this notion of a constitutional monarchy, they were trying to figure out how to uh, do both in a way that honored uh, in the end neither. And then you get into that classic reign of virtue and terror um, the, that uh, is always uh, connected with Robespierre and the Jacobins. And then after that, in the French case, the, the ascension of Napoleon uh, and the Thermidorian phase, as they call it, uh, yeah. where the advances of the revolution are consolidated, but in a way that goes back to the ancien regime, but in a completely different, in a, in uh, a different way, yeah, authoritarian way. Yeah. So I'd love to hear your just comments on on that progression in the French Revolution, and I would guess in particular. Um, the reign of virtue and terror, which, you know, in terms of the popular mythology of the French Revolution, you know, there's the uh, uh, yeah uh, the guillotine and the women knitting in front of the guillotine, and you know, and then of course then the rise of Napoleon, uh, who crowned himself emperor. Just comment um, on those yeah. those aspects so of in the revolution. 1793, that's during the terror. Uh, uh, a journalist called uh, Malé Dupont, who was uh, born in, he was a Genevese situ uh, citizen originally, but he had been working in, the, in Britain and in France as a journalist, and he was in charge of the political uh, articles in the Mercure de France uh, at, at the end of the Ancien Régime under Louis XVI. And in 1793, he wrote an essay which was called Consideration on the French Revolution and its Origins. And in these, he says, like Saturn, the revolution in France is eating its own children. So that's exactly what you, are, you were saying. And this has come back, but he's the first one to have said it. 
It has been used afterwards quite a few times, this, uh, this idea. And so it, how did it happen? As I told you earlier, the French people were feeling rather unhappy because they, there was, you know, there was famine, there were wars, there were all kinds of difficulties in the daily life of the people. Even if next to it, the court was brilliant and you had fantastic things going on. And so it's really the type of inequality that you have now in the US or growing up in Europe between the two or 3% the, at, at the top level and the 90 or 95% uh, at the low, in the lower level. And in between you have three or 4% who try to, to, to bridge the gap. So that's the situation in uh, 1788. And the, the fact that people had difficulty to eat, uh, you know, that's really a good stimulus to try to say, well, we, want to have, we want to have something to the government to do something about it. So uh, in 1788, it was decided to organize the, 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 the Etats Généraux which the Etat Généraux is just, it's a very old institution going back to the Middle Ages, a little like uh, uh, John Lacklands in 1215s had to listen to the barons to, to write the famous Magna Carta and the barons were organized in a kind of group council, which was the equivalent of the Etat Généraux or parliament. And so that you had parliaments in France in each of the provinces not all of them, but quite a few. So there was a, a Parlement in Toulouse, a Parlement in Marseille, in Mar et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the king said, instead of having small groups discussing the things, let's have them all. That's why it's called the Etat Généraux, bringing them all to, to Versailles. And we will ask, and this was, the, the order was given in February 89. All the, the future, deputies coming to, the, to Versailles had to ask from the people around to write cahier de doléances. That is, they had to write a, a list of all the complaints. So, uh, you know, people in the villages or in the small cities started writing down, I, I think we should do this or we should do that. And all this was, these doléances, these complaints were put together and brought to Versailles, and this was the basis for the discussions of the laws which had to be done to try to solve some of these problems. So when they, they, they arrived in, in, uh, in uh, Versailles, that was at the court, uh, they were meeting in one of the big dance halls of uh, the monarchy, La Salle des Menus Plaisirs, and uh, so they were all these, they were 1,200, people, you know, and there were 600 representing the aristocracy and the church, 300 to 300, and uh, another 600 with the curetta, that is all the other people. So these people all met together and they started doing all this work, but uh, it was difficult to have really a, a, a global interest. And so the first people who managed to say something were the monarchists. They said, let's do like, we, like it is in England. In England, since 1688, they have a constitutional monarchy and it's working pretty well and they have a bill of rights. So why don't we import the English model and try it in France? So this was the constitutionalist or the monarchist. And uh, when there were problems with Louis XVI and the people said it was going too slowly, so they moved, they decided to bring the king back to Paris and you move from the Etat Généraux to a new assembly, which was called the constituting, constitutive, I don't know, assembly, and uh, where they would start working on, on a constitution. That was a completely different way of moving so and really trying to see things. And during this period, they suppressed the church, they, they, you know, nationalized all the goods, then they, they suppressed the clergy, then they suppressed, 
you know, um, they suppressed the, the corporations. They, they did all kinds of things. They were just, that's a tabula rasa. They were dis destroying all the reference points, which were the legal anchoring of the French country, the French kingdom by, or, or, or the nation, you see. And uh, then when they finished the constitution, it became a legislative assembly because they, this was accepted. And the king was then uh, put into prison. Uh, well, it's very complex, it's much more complex than that. But anyway, there were good reasons to put the, the king in prison. The king had tried to fly away, uh, to flee to uh, Austria, etc. He was brought back. But that, so, you know, people had no longer great confidence in him. So he was put into prison. And this leads to, on the 21st of September, 92, to the creation of the first republic. They it was decided we get rid of the monarchy for once and for all. So, you know, we have moved from this institutional system, constitutional system, we move to a system which is really trying to make tabula rasa of all the past. And then the next thing is really to get rid of the king. But the king was, you know, the, the royal figure after 1200 years was, very important in, in the, still in the mind of the people. And it was difficult to attack the king. But anyway, he was arrested in September 93, uh, 92 and brought to, into prison. And then there was his you know, trial and he was considered to be guilty of having betrayed France. And uh, on the 21st of January, 93, he was beheaded. And those, at the same time, uh, the queen, Marie Antoinette, was also had been taken with the, the, the children in the same prison, which was La Tour du Temple. La Tour du Temple was the rest, the remain of the Templars Center in France, it, which is a, again, very interesting kind of correlation between the Templars of the 12th century, 13th century, which are gotten rid of by one of the kings, predecessor of Louis XVI. They are burned to the stake. And Louis XVI is, and his family, is in the last remnants of the Templars castle in France. So the queen had to stay another eight months into that, that prison. Then she was brought to the conciergerie and she was beheaded too as her sister and, and so on. So, you know, you see the, the, the type of devouring of the children of the revolution. And so, and every time a party was taking over, said the regionalists, les Girondins, took over for two, one or two years and tried to build a, a French kingdom or a French nation on the American model. And this was refused by the Jacobines Jacobin, because they said, we, we must have a strong centralized country. Otherwise we never be able to win the wars we are starting with the, the brother-in-law of uh, Marie Antoinette, Joseph d'Autriche or the, and, and so on. So, you know, they started war in 1792, just before the king was taken to prison uh, with Austria, allied with Prussia, and then the year after, they declared war to Britain, to Holland, and later to Spain. So, you know, the whole country was at war with the rest of Europe. And as there were nobody to, they had little money, and they, had, they needed soldiers. What happened? They decided on general conscription. So all men had to be, become soldiers of the Republic. And, uh, be able to go around and fight for the Republic. And that's why you have La Marseillaise, which was, became the song of the, 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 the troops, which says, Allons, enfants de la patrie, let's go, we the children of the, of the fatherland. And uh, the day of glory has arrived and the blood of our enemies is going to flow into 
the earth. So, you know, it's one of the most terrible the national anthems if you, if you look at the, at, the, at the words when they are sung today, but they made sense in, in the time of the revolution because really France was at war with everybody. And you have to remember at the same time that not all the French were for that. So in Brittany, in the central part of France, in Vendée and so on, there was people who rebelled against the, the Republic. And these people were the, the so-called Chouan and for, from 73 three and four, there was really a civil war in, in the middle of France. So that's the situation uh, of the French in 1793, 1994, which explains the terror because uh, you need this really strong people in the middle to be able to say this, you have to do this, you have to do it. France had become an army or had become a garrison and everybody had to follow uh, the orders of the corporal or of the lieutenants, etc., to be able to save the country. And so at first the war, there, there were some moments of the war and in the war, Lafayette was one of the generals again. So, and in Belgium in particular. So he, they managed to win over some of the Austrian troops, but it took, you know, for two or three years, they were just movements into France, out of France, etc., with the various troops trying to come in. So that explains that when Napoleon, who was one of those uh, soldiers and one of the generals of these armies, uh, when he, in 95, he managed to get rid of some of the people in France who were against uh, moving away from the old, from the new system. So Napoleon, well, Bonaparte in those days, uh, just uh, suppressed them and became a key person in the system of the Directoire. He was not yet at the, at the top, but he was a key person. And that's why in 1798, he led uh, the, uh, the French into Egypt, that's the Compagne d'Egypte uh, against the Brits. So, you know, the Brits are always there around, but anyway, and then from there moved to uh, a coup d'etat in 1799, which is called Brumaire, coup d'etat, and that decided about the new government, which is the consulat, where there were three consuls working together to run the country but the country was run like an army. And in fact, you know, Napoleon had been offered on a plate, a government and a country which was ready for regression or for obedience. And everybody had to obey. Every, there, there was a very strict uh, police, a secret police and so on, you know, organized by Talleyrand and people like that and Fouché. And so these, France moved in, 15 years, well, in 15 years, from a country opening to all possibilities, like the thousand flowers in Mao, China, and then very quickly, it just went through the whole system right. and arrived in 1895, still, there was still something left. Monarchy was no longer there. The system, the various, uh, the church had been, con you know, uh, set aside, uh, all kinds of things had happened, which are going to stay in the history of the French people. Good, good, thank you. Thank you, that was a good uh, overview. So let's turn, uh, Andres, to this larger question of all that you know about the French Revolution. What aspects do you think we need to pay attention to today? What's the, the relevance of what happened then, over 200 years ago, uh, to what we're experiencing today? Well, it's the question of who owns power? Because the whole French Revolution was really, how can you shift the power from right. the people who had been running the country for so many years to a new type of power, which would recognize the importance of merit. So it was not birth, which was important, it was merit. And so that people could develop and uh, that's 
the, the American dream, if you want. Now, today we consider this to be American dream, but in those days, it was a French dream. And um, then we, today, we have the same thing. We, are, we see our freedoms being constantly reduced. You know, with the Patriots Act after 9-11, the US government has, can take people in put them into prison uh, and do everything with them and have them disappear, which is exactly what uh, the French were saying against Louis XVI, Louis XVI with the lettre de cachet. They could put everybody in the, in, the, in the Bastille. Now you can put everybody in, in Guantanamo. Well, just an, it's, it's a uh, hazardous type of uh, comparison, but it is, I think, a valid comparison. Yes. And since, this, uh, since 9-11, and this is the same all over the world. The Americans are leading the way, not the best <laughs> for the best, but all, all kinds of uh, things are happening which are reducing our personal freedom. So, for example, the liberty of the press. So more and more, uh, you are being censored and not even by the government, but by Google or by Facebook and so on, so that you know, if uh, it happens that you, you put on Facebook something about vaccines, for example, or about uh, different ideas about where China and where the, the, the COVID came from, etc., this is censored. And, and you know, the algorithms designed for, for Google, etc., but this is censored. And people don't say anything, or very little because they are brought into this aspect of fear, which is exactly what was before the French Revolution. And uh, before the French Revolution, yes, the Bastille was there to put people in, the, in secret. Yes, the press was constantly uh, censored. Yes, uh, you, you, you were never sure of something, but, uh, and, and, you know, the fight was to have the habeas corpus, which had been recognized in Britain in uh, 1689, and to bring it into France. Habeas corpus means you can be arrested, but after one day you have to be allowed out if, yeah, if you don't have a good reason to keep the person in. So these all things which are now abandoned by our great democracies, for a return to the type of slave, slavery or serfdom, which was before the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's why it's so important to reread uh, people like Beaumarchais. Uh, and uh, he, you know, he wrote in uh, Le Barbier de Séville, he wrote a famous, uh, at least for the for a school in France or Switzerland, in the French speaking part of Switzerland, we all have to write an essay on that part of, uh, of the play, which was called The Praise of Slander. So, Le Grand Air de la Calomnie, which, you find, which is an aria de la calumnia in uh, Barbiere de Sevilla from, by, by Rossini. So, where uh, Beaumarchais speaks how, about how the rumor starts in a small corner of, uh, uh, of the town, and then it's, it goes to another person and how it grows, etc. until the moment where it's everywhere and everybody has to obey to this fake news. They don't call it like that, but it's what it means. The calumnia, slander, how you can slander people. And, uh, Beaumarchais has been, as a person, has been fighting against censorship. For example, when uh, he wrote the second of his three Spanish plays, The Mariage de Figaro, the Noce de Figaro, which has been taken up by Mozart uh, as an opera. So he, he presented the text, the written text, to the court in Versailles. And the queen was very inter interested. She said, oh, that's interesting text. But, and they decided to play it as amateurs 
And then Louis XVI saw that and he said, you can never do that because this is the end of, our, of, our, of the monarchy if you do that. And so it took four years until the aristocrats who had been playing this and thought it was a very good play, managed to convince Louis XVI that he had to relent and allow the play to be played. And in 1784, there was uh, Beaumarchais and La Comédie Française, so very official type of group, took that play and started playing it. And for the first performance, everybody wanted to get in. And because the aristocrats had heard that the queen and the court was interested, the, the others wanted to see why the queen wasn't interested. Everybody was there for, from the, the point of view of marketing. It was fantastic. So you had hundreds of people and you, you have to imagine the stagecoaches, the, the valets and all the people uh, around uh, bringing, helping people to get into the theater. And there was so much a uh, throng of people around the, th around the theater that four people died suffocated by the press of the people who were trying to get into the, into the theater. So uh, Beaumarchais managed to get into uh, the, 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 the theater, but he didn't want to be seen. So he went into uh, the cage of uh, the souffleur, you, you know, the person who helps the, uh, the various actors if they forget something, uh, the, the, there is somebody who helps whistling to them what they have to uh, what do they have to say. So to see what was going on in a very discreet way, and the whole hall just exploded in bravos and laughed, etc. And some people say that is the cultural end of the mat the monarchy. From that moment on, the in the monarchy had accepted to be abandoned by fate and destiny. They were no longer in, in power in the mind of the people. So that's the power of the press. That's the power of uh, suppression of the press. And these are the problems we have today. Yes, well, that brings us to the, the final question that I wanted to put to you, Andres. Thank you so much for that. You're a, a veritable encyclopedia. <laughs> Um, you know, the, 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 the hallmark of the French Revolution, you know, the three words, uh, liberty, fraternity, equality. Um, what did they mean then and what do they need to mean now? Well, at first, during the French Revolution in 1789, uh, there were only the first two names which came out officially, liberté, égalité. And this went back to Rousseau, and Rousseau spoke about all men being free and equal from the birth. This, an aspect which was taken again over by the Declaration uh, of Independence in the States, but this comes from Rousseau. And so they did the same in France. They took Rousseau, and uh, incidentally, in 1794, uh, the body of Rousseau was taken to the Pantheon. The Pantheon in France is the main church. It's like Westminster Abbey for all the kings and so on, or Saint Denis, which was in France for the kings. So it's the official place where you put grand homme, people who have counted in the life of the country. So Rousseau was brought there in 1794. Uh, Voltaire had been already taken as the first one to enter the Pantheon in 1789. <laughs> so it's an interesting bypass explaining this liberté égalité. And it's in 1793, the Commune of Paris, which I have mentioned already two or three times, decided that it was important to add fraternity to the slogan or the motto. And on the Hotel de Ville in Paris, they had a big sign, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, which is the motto of, of the French Republic today, and under, or oh, death. So, you know, it was really very clear. It was, they wanted to have it, and if this was not possible, they were ready to die for it. Huh? So it gives another, 
another taste or flavor mm. to the whole thing. And it's only in the Revolution de Juillet, in July 1830, that fraternity was added to the, the three. And it's only much later in the Third Republic that it became the official motto of the Republic. So the liberty and equality are really the main elements of, from the political point of view. And fraternity was added more from a moral point of view. Imagine that the church had been destroyed, that the clergy was, if they were still a clergy, they were under the rule of the government uh, and they had to preach what the government was saying, not what the church was saying and so on. So, you know, uh, the idea of good and evil from a moral point of view was forgotten, or at least was no longer preached along. And it was important for fraternity to become the kind of link to cover liberty and freedom and, and uh, equality. Because in fact, liberty and equality are opposites, if you think. If you want everybody to be equal, well, then everybody, it's a uniform system with everybody is getting the same thing. It's what has been from them at the time of the revolution already, there were people saying, we have to do like that. Everybody should be, have the same thing. We are all born through nature equal. So we must all have the same thing. But liberty was saying on the contrary, well, we're all equal, but we, have different uh, conditions, we have different talents, and these talents can be expressed through merit. So you see the two things were, op op were opposed. So fraternity was a good way to try to bring them in and make a, uh, a soup which has some taste with the three ingredients. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how it, it developed. And you, this was something I haven't mentioned, but where we were speaking about communism and going to the extreme of ideas, you have people like Gracchus Babeuf, who uh, was one of these important people. They were, every day they were printing ideas and so on. And, you know, Paris was full of leaflets about these ones or that, those ones uh, trying to get this or that to be done. And Gracchus Babeuf was a communist. He's the father of the communist movement. And Marx has been studying and Engels have been studying Gracchus Babeuf and he's also considered as one of the fathers of the Commune of Paris in 1871. And another one is Anachazis de Clos, who like Paine was a member of, Thomas Paine was a member of the assembly. And as, as a foreigner, but still he was allowed to come and vote and be, because the revolution considered itself to be for the whole of the world, not simply for France. So the, from the beginning, there was this kind of France leading the way with a torch of freedom in front of, uh, you know, uh, which is why you have the, the Statue of the Liberty in the, in the harbor of New York by Bartholdi, which is a, a, again, a gift of the French to the US. And uh, so the Anarchist de Clothes was a geometry man. He was Dutch, and uh, but Prussian, well, the origin, and, but uh, then he, it's a part of the Holland which was taken by the Prussians. So he was considered as a Prussian, but he was in France. And he, at the assembly, he was asking for France to be divided into grid, in, 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 make a grid of squares uh, of all the same 60 kilometers each on the side, you know, and then you put this, this, this on the geography and this, each of these squares would correspond to a section, an, administri an administrative section. Even if, you know, at the, at the, at the corners of, the, of this, this would be in the middle of Paris. So it would be a part which would be in one department and another street would be on the next department. This is a crazy idea. But, uh, you know, that's the type of extreme ideas which were played with and, 
you have to see that if you, if you are interested in the revolution, you, most of the ideas which are going to shape the next 200 years or perhaps 300 years of our history have been expressed in these three years. Yeah. Well, uh, Andres, thank you so much. You uh, have brought much uh, depth and wisdom on this day uh, okay. as we celebrate the uh, French Revolution. And I just want to uh, thank you on behalf of everyone. If you've been watching the chats, people are uh, in awe <laughs> of, <laughs> <I will> look. <laughs> of your uh, memory. I wish I had a memory like you, man. <laughs> and uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, and I think the, the the final thought that I would have is that just to uh, echo what Andres just said that, you know, it's often said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And uh, there are rhymes between 9-11 and the Patriot Act and the Ancien Regime and the draconian aspects of, of Napoleon and other uh, events and, and cycles of history in other countries. Yeah, and, and uh, personally, I would like people to rebel against what is happening with a pandemic, you know, <laughs> and say enough is enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But this and, is uh, very so dangerous because I could be considered a Trumpian, which I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, then thank you so much. Enjoy your celebrations tonight, Andres, and, and all of you French uh, who are watching this, uh, uh, this session today. Uh, and then tomorrow, uh, we'll meet at the same time, uh, 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock p.m. Central European time. And tomorrow we're going to take up an issue that we've dealt with um, around the edges before. And that is uh, how we create our energetic, how we create our energetic transformation at scale. We often talk about personal transformation. We're just seeing, a, hearing a lecture, uh, a dialogue on the transformation of an entire people. And the French Revolution helped to transform and helped to create the modern world, in fact. And so how do we understand this phenomenon of transformation? And how do we actually interact with earth energies to develop the transformation that we seek. That's going to be tomorrow, um, July 15th, 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock p.m. Central European time. So thanks again, Andres. You've been sublime. And thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy your Bastille Day. Thank you. Ooh.